Hi, I'm Amber Bach, uh, Superintendent of Schools here in Westboro. Super happy to join you today at Westboro TV, and I'm here with two of my most favorite people. Um, I'm here with Roger Anderson, Director of Wellness, and Kim Tynan, Clinical Director for the Westboro Public Schools. The two of them are kind of the mighty duo who support us across pre-K to 12 and even beyond into our 22-year-old program to really think about making sure that our students thrive here in Westboro. Every child who comes here can get educated, get connected, leave us and head off to their next best things. So um, we're excited today because one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is how we can make sure that we're providing more information to families in the community about the amazing stuff going on here in Westboro. And when we find ourselves hearing lots of questions from people, it feels really like the perfect opportunity to come to Westboro TV and do a video. So today what we're going to do is talk about social emotional learning. We've had a lot of really good opportunities to talk with parents, but we also realize it doesn't reach out into the community. So it's a chance for us to sit today and have a conversation around social emotional learning and to answer the frequently asked questions that we've received. Um, I certainly will open this up as a conversation. We'll leave it informal. We've got some slides. And our goal today is that when you've left this conversation, you have a real sense about what social emotional learning is in Westboro. And then, of course, you can always follow up with us. Um, Certainly, myself, as a longtime educator, I am a lifelong educator. My whole career has been in education from teaching to being a principal to coming into um, different roles across different dr districts. We as a, as a industry have always worked on building community with children, making sure that they can manage their social situations, making sure they can live together at school, on their sports teams, on the bus, at recess. Um, I certainly remember my own days long ago teaching, um, working through uh, Open Circle, which was a curriculum where you really, how do you come together in an open circle and um, debrief on issues that have gone on socially between children and teach them how to have a common language for how to talk to each other and how to be um, caring and kind. Um, I know we've also over the years used responsive classroom, we've used restorative discipline. All of these are kind of the uh, curriculum array of ways that schools over years and years have responded. I'm sure those are curriculums familiar for both of you guys as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think what people really want to know is you know, well, what are we doing here in Westboro? And for me, I think it became um, interesting to see that once um, the Department of Education, DESE, as people will hear it referred to, um, mobilized uh, an SEL curriculum framework and really actively engaged in um, speaking about the need for this in schools, uh, that there became more questions about it. And it's certainly understandable given once a large organization grasps something, it raises more questions for people about, you know, is this like a controlled discipline of <laughs> curriculum? And I think there have been lots of interesting questions. So today we wanna to kind of dive in on that. Um, so, you know, for me, certainly it's a core role and I speak as a superintendent here that we want to equip every child at the different developmental ages to deal with navigating their social emotional lives um, with each other in the classroom, on the playground, but also certainly on their sports teams and everything beyond us as well. Um, so I thought what we would want to do is maybe dive into some of the questions that are being asked of us and then you guys can, as the experts on this, really help us to um, explain what, uh, what we're doing here in Westboro. Sure. So one of the questions that come to me is kind of like, we've talked a little bit of kind of like, where does SEL come from? We've talked just a little bit about that, just from our work to make sure that children can, can navigate being together in the classroom. Um, how long have we been doing SEL in our schools? Maybe you could talk about kind of what it looks like here in Westboro. Yeah. I mean, we've, uh, to your point, we, we've been incorporating social emotional learning in our classrooms forever. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when DESE, you know, really formalized the learning, it was really to standardize the work and use evidence-based practices across all kids so that you had this consistency of instruction and learning happening for oh, every that's, child. That's interesting. I think you're right. I mean, 
for me, like I said, I mean, I can go all the way back to when I was teaching in Newton, when I was teaching in Ohio, like you, you had to build a classroom climate, you had to build a classroom culture. And many times you were digging up those pieces and trying to build them into lessons that made sense in your classroom. But I also think that um, standardizing excellence is a practice in our industry that's more pervasive now. And we'd all like to think industries continue to improve. And I think education has improved where they've created stronger frameworks so that curriculum can make sense over time with students. I think that's led to a lot of questions from people um, just because we want to be transparent around kind of, well, what are we working on with kids? So. Um, I think DESE definitely led into using that, and they have some organizations they work on. I wonder if you can share a little bit about kind of the framework that DESE did. Yeah, sure. Um, well, DESE has aligned their work with an agency or a group called CASEL, which stands for the Collaboration of Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And that is a group that's been in place for close to 30 years now, really pulling the you know, strongest evidence base around this work and then dispersing it to across the United States. Yeah, no, I actually went to a CASEL workshop. I don't want to date myself, but I mean, probably back in like early 90s and the 80s where they were starting to create some of the visual frameworks they mm -hmm. use. And I think that's certainly one of, of my memories of pieces. And, and I could see at that time how like open circle and responsive classroom kind of intertwined with all the same themes. So I wonder if we could, I think you have some slides on that. Maybe we could look mm -hmm. at some of the slides. I wonder, um, so how does this desire to make sure that we're supporting students being able to um, all live together well with empathy and, and kindness like so tell me about like how does this all fit into like what we're focusing on so you know one of the questions is kind of like all right so what are the skills you're teaching my children and how are you doing that so um, you know tell me a little bit about this this circle here that, that we see yeah so we've identified that there are five main competency areas that we want kids to become proficient at and it looks really different across the ages um, and we'll show you some examples of that in a moment um, the the main areas are self awareness um, you know I think everybody understands what that means we want kids to be able to um, understand their strengths the kinds of things they might need to work at what they're what they're really good at what they can bring to a group and and where they need to do some work and learning. Um, Self-management skills. We talk about um, self-awareness, I mean, uh, social awareness, sorry. Uh, relationship building, and then responsible decision-making. And so Roger, you certainly as somebody across, and you, have, you two have like beautifully intertwined roles across the district. So as a clinical director, you're thinking about really, um, social psycho supports for students in some sort of ways. You think about what is the psychology of how students need support mm -hmm. in order to thrive. You've got this whole branch of wellness, which overlaps to that, but, but you also pick up the health branch of curriculum too, which you know is an interesting part of conversation. Um, you've, Roger, really over the years brought to me the Metro West data and the mm -hmm. importance of that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I see this as really intertwined with that. Sure. I think, you know, the, the way we approach it in health, and, and we're really talking about OCL today, maybe health is, is our next presentation yeah. along yeah, the way. Fun. But this is a set of skills that students can apply to whatever comes across their plate in life. Um, as they interact with their peers, as they move their way along, I can't think of anybody who wouldn't want to have good self-awareness or parents who wouldn't want their child to be great responsible decision makers who can self-manage and relate to others in positive ways. And we know there's a lot of research along the way that, that shows when in the classroom or in the school these skills are in place with both adults and kids that that's when people really thrive. That's when students do well academically. That's when students do well socially. And I think maybe we can all think back to a, a classroom that we were involved in at some point where it was just a great place to be. Yeah. And when that happens, it's because these skills are in place. There's strong relationships. There's trust. It's a safe place. If Kim and I have a disagreement, we, we work to work that out mm -hmm. between us with support from the adults that are there. And then we can move forward and really learn at a high rate. Because I think one of the things that social-emotional learning does, I know it, um, that it does is it is it allows people to be very effective academically. Yeah, I think there are these two. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think 
um, there's these layers here, which is when we're doing this work well, it looks invisible and seamless, right? It's like, oh, that's just an amazing teacher who knows how to make my child feel safe and well cared for. But they've also nurtured the capacity for those relationships between students. And I think that's the part that can somewhat be invisible because I think schools are this beautiful bastion of like the whole world coming together. Every child who walks through our doors is their own unique person and they live intensively together for six hours a day in these mm -hmm. classroom cultures. And, and it becomes, you know, this in kind of beautiful thing when you walk into a classroom that's humming along and you see student relationships, but it isn't like accidental. And I think that's Correct. the part where yeah. what we want to do is be like, yeah, well, let's get behind the green screen here and see like we build that stuff. That's what strong teachers do. Mm -hmm. And and you use tools that that standardize that. One of the things that I think people ask me about is, well, um, you know, what's developmentally appropriate? Like, are you bringing up topics that are too complex for students to handle yet? Or, um, you know, how do we how do we strand that out and does it grow over time? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. And I don't know if you have other slides you wanna use, but I just think we should talk about like, what about the developmental continuum of this work? Yeah, I mean, I think selecting um, very strong curriculum is a really important part of the work. I mean, that's the work that we do across all curriculum areas in Westboro. I mean, we we really seek out, you know, that rigorous curriculum that's going to be developmentally appropriate. And so if you, um, there are some slides actually, we can kind of look at what it looks like. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are some pictures of, you know, what instruction looks like in at some of the various grades. Um, you see that it's very much a large group conversation with their specific objectives that are happening. Um, and it's also important to really talk about how much time we're dedicating to, to this work. Um, I, I think that people aren't really sure that, you know, how often are we actually teaching these lessons. Yes, it happens all the time, um, as mm. you mentioned earlier. It's incorporated into all the work that we do throughout the school day. And yet the time dedicated to actual skill instruction, um, we, you know, just to give people a sense of what that looks like is from pre-K through grade six, it's about um, 30 minutes a week um, and about 20 lessons, 20 to 22 lessons across the school year. Um, so with holidays and things like that, yeah. um, you know, it kind of gets broken up. And then at the middle school level, um, the, we have, again, it's about 30 minute lessons. There are 10 lessons that get presented to students during their crew time together. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about, about 30 minutes every, uh, like, every two weeks or so. Um, and again, so again, with holidays and things like that, it gets yeah. broken up throughout the year. At the high school, um, like what, do you, what do you guys have going on at the high school? I know you've seen pieces of that. I think it's like seven to 12 lessons. Yeah. Like talk a little bit about I that. I think it ebbs and flows. Um, at the high school, it's, it's about, you know, you might say one lesson a month. Mm. Um, and, and the nice part about it is, is it's taught by everybody to everybody. Because one of the questions we've heard is like, does it, does it really matter in, in science or math to have mm -hmm. these skills? And I think unequivocally the answer is yes. In, in science labs, if, if the three of us are partnered in a lab, if we don't have the ability to communicate effectively, we're gonna have a hard time getting sure. that lab done. Yeah. And if we have disagreements, we, we gotta figure out how to navigate those or who's gonna lead and who's gonna follow in this particular situation. How to manage your anxiety in high performing uh, districts. I think that's a huge one that lies underneath the, the, when you're looking at like rigorous curriculum across areas where students have interests that they think they wanna carry into college. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of social pressure around that. No question about I, that. I think there's also this piece where I don't think there like this is what parents like call us about people parents want to the emails we get that that principals get that classroom teachers get that you guys get really center on parents saying hey my child's anxious about this or this group's hard or mm -hmm. they had a problem at lunch or this social online stuff has dismantled my son's self-esteem and you know we need help navigating this so kind of the mix of being a participant in both educating and supporting students. We're all kind of raising them together in this world of complexities and wonder. And I think that's where parents are often seeking support. And like, this is the arm of that work where we yeah. standardize it a little bit. Um, and then there's all the subtle relationship work, which we have to manage with them. But yeah, I think if you back up a step and, and look at it, um, you know, we have set curriculum that is taught in the lessons that Kim described. 
embedded in the fabric of, of a classroom, as you say, or you know, what are the classroom norms? How has that teacher established things? What are, what are the characteristics of a great school? You know, across mm -hmm. the school, mm -hmm. there are these themes. You know, sometimes they're monthly, or sometimes the theme for the year is, for example, empathy. These are social emotional learning skills. But when it comes right down to it, I think each student, we want to be really skilled in, in these particular skills so they can navigate whatever comes along their way because we can't predict what one student's going to run into versus another versus another. Right. However, if they can communicate well, if they can advocate for themselves, if they can navigate and manage themselves when something gets hard, because invariably things are going to be challenging. As you said, in a high-performing district, we ask a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they ask a lot of each other. You know, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer pressure sometimes, right. or my peers in the neighboring town, and how they manage that and how they effectively move through that are skills that I think everyone would want their child to have. And through their path with us, the hope is that they develop those. Well, and I think, you know, again, parents talk about this all the time. I mean, I've raised two kids that are now 25 and 27, and you're still a parent. It just evolves and changes. Um, but one of the things I think about is kind of like the explicit instruction. And they always say, talk to your child when they're young about challenges they'll face later. Because in the moment, this is what we always tell parents who have young children who don't have high schoolers yet, mm -hmm. or college students or 25 and 27-year-olds, you know, the the preparation that those underpinnings are done when they're little the keys of character at mill pond right mm -hmm. and then you have this so you're down at preschool and they've got the little puppets and the puppets are talking to each other about you hurt my feelings and how do you feel or can i play with you and like all these kind of framework pieces are the underpinnings and then that is the same it's like that book everything i needed to know i learned mm -hmm. in kindergarten it's been around forever this whole yes. idea of like what you learn when you're little like grows and then i know from keys to character you end up hopping up to Gibbons in the high school where you shift over to the trails curriculum, which mm -hmm. again is a more sophisticated leap toward um, problem solving where kids can talk through the dynamics of different social situations and be kind of prepared. But it draws upon the same stuff. Yeah. And, which, you know. and even beyond that, it's, it's very clear that the employers that we are preparing them for, you know, once they go off to college or wherever they go after high school, the employers are very clear that it's these skills they are looking for that make you employable. They, oh, yeah. The employers know that, that now the jobs are changing faster than they ever have. Mm. You know, what the job looks like um, in, in engineering today, five years from now, may, may be vastly different for an electrical engineer as new technology comes around. But the skill set to be able to do these things, to be able to work through problems, to be able to engage with other people to help you solve them, the employers are very clear that this is what they're looking for. Oh, I, I'm yeah, for sure. I'm immensely proud of this district on so many levels. And one, I love the community in Westboro. It's just it all fits together in so many ways. But we graduate a kid who heads off to things where, and, and as somebody who has, you know, now children that are young adults, and my daughter's in HR, so it's kind of interesting to have her talk about the skills she sees young people don't have. And I feel incredibly proud of the fact that I have confidence that when you have a Westboro graduate head out, they can navigate social situations, they can manage complex coursework and know when they need self-help and wellness, and they, they, they rotate those skills through how they care for themselves. Do they know how to handle it? And I'm like, yeah, I think our kids do. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, Roger, one of the things we've talked about is the mental health of our mm -hmm. students. And I think people see this statistically out in the world. And I think one of the questions people say is like, are we making them more anxious by talking about it? Or mm -hmm. So I just, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so we know we, we collect a lot of data on, on our students. We are part of the Metro West Healthcare Foundation grant to uh, look at adolescent behaviors. Um, we do some screening for mental health uh, in our school yearly at, at an increasing number of grades. And we know that um, a number of our students at the end of this do struggle sometimes with mental health. And, and I, I want to sort of be clear that SEL and mental health aren't the same thing, but the skills being taught to everyone across all grades can increase your chances of navigating the mental health challenges you have along the way. So we know that 19% of our middle school students and 25% of our high school students identify with some depressive symptoms. That's pretty consistent data over time for us. However, we also know that, and I think Kim can speak to it maybe even more articulately, the skills that we build through all students 
can help them handle those challenges when they come along. Maybe you can talk about that, Ken. Yeah, um, I think you know we provide students with the ability to recognize their own feelings. That's going to help them start to identify when they might be struggling. Um, also to be able to recognize it in others. I mean, when we think about our kids graduating, um, they often become, you know, very skilled at being helpers with other mm -hmm. people who are struggling mm -hmm. um, at college or, or in life in general. Um, we, we help them to recognize the supports that are available within a community, um, understanding the important adults in their life, both mm -hmm. at school and at home, um, who they can go to when they do need support. Learning how to ask for help is a really important skill that you mm -hmm. need for life. Again, we're teaching kids to be able to be resilient and to recognize that challenges are gonna happen and we wanna give them the skills they need in order to be able to navigate it. No, I, I, well said. I mean, I, I think the other thing is one of the things that people ask about is they'll, they also hear us talk about tiered interventions. And I think um, I, they have a hard, I, I think it's hard for people to then understand like what are all these pieces of what you guys are doing it's confusing um and so and i the way i frame it with people and you can help me out then and explain i mean i feel like social emotional learning curriculum and this base curriculum we're talking about is core to all mm -hmm. and yet what we want is students to know to ask for help so the sel skill just walk me through if i'm doing this right like the sel skill across those years teaches kids to know i should get help from an adult or a friend if i need it that's an SEL skill. Mm -hmm. um, we teach that to all kids, parents reinforce it. We all work around that network. Um, if you got bullied in the hockey you know, room after the game, then you need to talk to an adult. We don't know that's happening. You gotta go for help. You don't have to just put up with that, like mm -hmm. how, to, how to do all those things. But then if you have someone who after an event say happens or they feel traumatized or they can't get over it or they have a level of anxiety that escalates, that's that moves out of SEL curriculum, right? So mm -hmm. then that is, but they know to ask for help. So they ask for help and a tier two help is we can do guidance support for you. You can get some counseling. We can give you some additional strategies. Maybe you need to be put into a partnership or friendship with somebody who has faced that anxiety themselves mm -hmm. and came out on the other side. Those are the more like tier two interventions. Yes. And who does those in our district? I mean, it's an array of people, mm -hmm. but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and you know, I think the more skills you have at tier one, the more the more you bring to the table if you do need tier two or tier three supports, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we want to like also affect the total amount of impact that a person may experience if they do experience a mental health, you know, challenge. Um, we have several really amazing uh, experts in our district who can provide psychoeducation to students who require a higher level of support. Um, those people are our school counselors, and we have mm -hmm. adjustment counselors and school counselors um, in all of our schools, and mm -hmm. those people are the ones who would be predominantly providing more support to students who might need them. I like that description. I think what's important to understand is that all of this is done in collaboration with families, working together in partnership to make sure that they know that there's like a safety net. We call it, it's funny because we call it an invisible safety net and now we're trying to explain it in that sense. But there's one of the things that I have trust in is that you don't want anyone to get lost. You don't want anyone to not get the help they need. And we need to have um, abilities to help students recover from things and move forward. Like that's the life of a district of 4,000 students all living together. And I think um, I have a lot of confidence in how all of these have to fit together because one of the things parents will say to us is like, well, you should know this because if something happened in sixth grade or they had a challenge with a set of kids, as an example, classic example, right? Mm -hmm. There was a social network of students that were complex for my child. I don't want them with them. They also need to recover from their feelings about, about a, a social situation. And now they're in seventh or eighth grade or up into the high school and it rears its head because they're now circling back each other through other social situations. So there's this need to know that there's this invisible safety net where we talk with each other, we make sure that there's continuity of information and that you know students can feel and parents can feel supported in knowing that over time, you know, there's nothing worse having to tell your story over and over again, right? So the idea is that, you know, we have networks of support and we work with each other to know that families and their children can be cared for pre-K to, to 22 yeah. um, if needed.
So um, let's change gears a little bit. I just want to make sure we're covering all the questions I get from people. This is like so great to have you answering all these questions. Um, I'm feeling very, very happy. Uh, let's see. One of the ones that people ask is like, well, why don't we just do core curriculum? I think you talked a little bit about that. Like we we do consider it core, but it doesn't distract from it. I mean, Roger, like, can no, you No, I think it to adds that? to it. There's irrefutable study after study after study that kids do better academically when they are strong in these skills. And I think we can all internalize that where... If I'm in a classroom and I'm feeling threatened by what's going on in my own body or what's going on around me, it's going to be much harder for me to engage with the curriculum that the teacher is, is working with me. So when we are feeling safe, when we're feeling empowered and, and are, we're managing ourselves well and we're in good relationship with those around us, we can really engage with the curriculum. So there's a lot of studies that, that show that academics improve significantly when these skills are taught to the students. I, gosh, that's like resonates with me. I feel like I could cry. You know, I think when you look back on your own, the thing is look back to your own histories. Mm -hmm. I think about, I was such a scared child. Like my identity was one, like, I just want to be at home. Like, take me home. School was not a place where my sense was like, boy, do I thrive here. Um, you know, and I, and that was when I was littler, but it, it that identity is base and it carries through. And, you know, it, it feeds into this idea, like, until you can feel confident, and it wasn't like I was a, maybe afraid of my teachers in some cases, so you have to have that safety relationship with teachers, which has to be developed through this mm -hmm. kind of work, but you need safety relationships with kids, and if you feel vulnerable or you feel seen or not seen, um, that anxiety definitely gets in the way of your feelings about the class where it happens. Like, I hate math because I hated this experience, right? I will never do math because mm -hmm. I had this experience, and so... That's like primal, like it's deep. It's like definitely identities you carry forward with you. And so as an industry, we've been more and more responsive to this because we, we live those stories and then we hear them. And so I just think our goal is to make sure that everybody feels seen, loved, heard, and that they can thrive. Like that's it for me. Like it just, the, the work that we do has to center on that. Um, I wonder about um, a piece of... Um, this part around, um, we've talked about kind of why my child needs to learn those skills, but one here that I like is this discussion around, I think Roger, this like hops over to you, but one of the questions, I got to grab this here, it's here. Um, one of the questions that there's been a lot of discussion around is all this uh, gender ad identity and mm -hmm. who kids are and are we putting more curriculum in front of them than they need and how does that all mix in with SEL and I, and, and I've explained to people on some levels that that's a branch of our health curriculum more mm -hmm. than SEL, but the, but pieces of it are entwined. So right. I just want to kind of throw you that one and have you talk a little sure. bit about Sure. Well, I think, I think Kim can answer the first question, which is, you know, is that a big topic in SEL? No, it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Such an explicit, pretty, clear answer. Pretty, uh, pretty explicit uh, answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I think things yeah. like acceptance. Yeah. Acceptance. Our presence. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, empathy and confidence in self. I mean, we want people, I guess, I, I feel like we want... awareness of others. Awareness and, and um, self-reflective. So there are pieces there where if, if a child is questioning themselves around their identity or the identity of their parents or the identity of their friend or like all of those things they might feel like they might ask questions about that and sure. in the framework of the SEL curriculum we would we would explore answering a question to help them feel sure. like yeah. supported well consider you know you have 20 to 25 little bodies that spend most of the day together right and they really need to be able to work together i mean mm -hmm. they, a lot of the work that we do in school is in groups yeah. and so we want kids to be able to have empathy for each other have perspective taking be able to listen to one another actively i mean in those are the skills that we work on yeah, I saw, um, I mean, I have the gift of seeing this in schools as I visit around. And one of the ones that I saw was this, I, it was at Mill Pond. I don't know if it was fifth or sixth grade. It might have been fifth. And they had this beautiful bulletin board, and it was these identity. It was these beautiful trees kids had mm -hmm. drawn. And it had, like, all the things that make them who they are, right? Mm -hmm. Like, here's who I am, all about me, right? You think about the boards you do down in first and second grade where you send in the picture of, like, all yeah. about my family and all mm -hmm. about me. And then that trajectory becomes more reflective by fifth grade, which is, like, what makes up who you are and 
where where are your strengths and and you know what makes you you and they do that in the fall to start to get to know each other so you know if, if religion is a big identity of mm -hmm. someone's life then that's where kids will ask each other about religious identity and and those are really exciting conversations but they have to be navigated within mm -hmm. like developmental windows and right. you know right. yeah I think I think you know SEL opens the door and then in the health curriculum we have national and state standards where we address you know a lot of these different things and and you know maybe that's the next conversation we have together yeah, yeah, makes a lot fun. of sense to put that on the table because it's all right there yeah. um, but I do think you know when when sensitive topics come up whether it's in SEL or in health our teachers are pretty well trained yeah. to, to work within the boundaries of what we have yeah. and and they can recognize um, and have language for things like you know that's a that's a really interesting question I don't know the answer to that question perhaps that's one you can ask your parents mm -hmm. and I think in the end when schools and parents and the student work together toward the student's benefit, um, I think that's when we function our best. And so we have very highly trained teachers. Um, our teachers are trained around SEL, um, but the health te teachers particularly are very well trained in how to navigate some of these really mm -hmm. tricky conversations. And while we aren't pushing any agenda ourselves, having our kids be aware of what they're walking into, aware of the world that they're a part of, and having the skill to navigate it is what we really hope for. I think what's important and when we do these kind of kind of conversations, I think what's important to do is say like, we really lean in on this work, we're comfortable with these conversations, we're, we welcome people asking those questions, and we're willing to always sit down and, and make sure that people feel like they're aware of what the trajectory of their children's experience is gonna be in school. And you know, it's a very human process. You have 700 faculty and staff across this district all interacting and 4,000 thousand students and so there's a wide array of experiences that are going to happen and so it's important for for us to empower families to be like yes ask that question check in with us and yet we can feel like we've had lots of individual conversations i think the power of doing like a, a video like this is to get a continuity of messaging out to people and be like, this is a conversation we've been having a lot. And sometimes people are afraid to ask if they're pestering us or something. So I think this kind of video work gives us a chance to have those conversations that aren't email, they're more personal, and they also give you a chance to kind of hear a wide array of how everything fits together. You can back up and listen to it again and then send us an email. That's the part <laughs> that I really want to welcome with people is this sense about we are a public education system and we really welcome, you know, interacting with people around all their questions. Um, I want to make sure we really cover all of this stuff today. We talked a little bit about kind of the questions we're um, seeing. Are there other pieces you guys want to make sure we put on the table that we kind of cover? Well, I wonder if we want to take a look at some of the videos yeah, of, our, of we, our kids. Yeah, why don't we take a minute um, and do that? You know, again, just to give people an idea of what it looks like in the classroom. So there's a couple of videos. I have um, some clips from a kindergarten classroom of what self-management looks like, and then there's a high school student. Um, so I think looking at the two of them, you'll see the trajectory of learning. Focus, focus, listen, listen. Use your self-talk. Be assertive. Focus, focus, listen, listen. Use your self-talk. Be assertive. Focus, focus, listen, listen. Use your self-talk. Be assertive. So as you can see from watching that video, you know, really helps to reinforce some of the basic skills that we're looking at, you know, for kindergartners to be uh, 
what their behavior should look <laughs> so at. So I will be singing it in my yes. head now. So it's like you know, <laughs> focusing and listening, um, being assertive. Those are all the yeah. skills we want to see in our classroom. We have like the, the videos where um, the kids also during snack, they have like the little songs in the background and they do the movement breaks now, which is yes. again, there is this really interesting interwoven piece between physical and mental health, right? A whole body health. And so I know across the trajectory of the elementary schools, there's a lot of the movement break videos where they do like yoga songs mm -hmm. and stretches and stand up and get the wiggles out. And then I find that we are singing those, you know, a lot. Um, so then there's this bit of clip from uh, self-management at the high schools. Yeah, Is this so, what we're going to see now? Yeah. So um, we can watch this clip now. This Great. student talking about his experiences. For resilience, I said some things that cause the stress is being very competitive in things that I do, worrying about schoolwork in general, and being frustrated about test scores and not letting them go. For solutions to try and not make it as bad, use a stress ball when something does not go well. Try your best, but if something doesn't work out, don't freak out and move on from past grades and study more so you don't get bad test scores. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, thanks. All right, so as you can see, you know, this is a student who is in a place right now after, you know, years of working and learning these skills where he can really recognize um, what strategies he might need to use to help be successful um, and really. Um, thinking about how he might be able to change his behavior, deal with some of the stress that he's experiencing in school. I love that. I mean, yeah. you do this through so much of your work, Roger, both as a coach and, and um, parent, but also in directing your team. I mean, mm -hmm. the breathing exercises, the take a pause, and yeah. we work on those even in our leadership team. We just all, we wanna all model and live that, that sense of, um, jobs are stressful and when students are at school it's their job mm -hmm. and yeah. so those interactive pieces require that they get those skills and be able but it's nice to see that they can then look at the arc of the experience and be like oh i've gotten better at this which yeah. feels really good yeah, yeah nice. i think i think part of what sel does is it, it sort of shines a light on the humanity for all of us we're yeah. all human yeah. you know and along the way we're we sometimes learn a lot when we fall down we got to dust ourselves off or dust off our friend and help them get back up and that's a lot of what's embedded here. Yeah, I think, and you, I love that you see it through the culture of the schools with students, which is, you know, they're good to each other 98% of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And 2% can feel like 20 or 30%. But mm -hmm. what's important is that we, um, we hear the positive energy that kids bring to being supportive to each other um, and, it is all of that incorporated into by the time you're sending kids off as graduates, they've got a skill set we're really, really proud of. So yeah. one of the questions that I get is also just as we're heading towards wrap up here is, you know, what can parents do? How do they interface with this curriculum and how do they complement the work we're doing so that it makes sense to students and they can also get that information out of kids at home to talk about it more. So what else, you know, what can families do to, to feed into this work? Well, I think the forward-facing documents that you refer to are going to be really helpful to families so they can see exactly what their kids mm -hmm. are learning. And then also the CDC provides um, a lot of really great tips and ideas that parents can use at home. And, you know, we have a few here at each of the different grade levels um, of things that, you know, parents can do that are going to help encourage, um, you know, their children's social emotional skills and yeah. their overall yeah. well-being. Yeah, it's so funny because when you read them, they feel so self-evident. But one of the things that we tell parents, and, and parenting is hard work, um, Rob Evans, who somebody I respect, a, a psychologist, says, you know, kids need high amounts of low dose quality time from, from family, mm -hmm. right? They don't need really special experiences that are very intense and overly developed. And I think about that when I look at this list, like it's about carving out those times where um, you're, you're talking about this stuff as a family and you'll hear the pieces filter forward and you can be curious and unpack them and reading and just, these are self-evident, but it, it, it's really good to hear them again. Just like we wanna be explicit with kids, it's nice to be explicit with families. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with having a plan. 
yeah. you know, much like we know sometimes a, a, with a group, whether it's a team or a classroom or, or, or a social group, it just sort of gels naturally. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with taking over its steps to ensure that that happens. Well, yeah. we, I mean, I have the gift of having older kids that are now adults, and I can say to myself, what if had I? And you don't want to live with regret. I'm not saying that. But it's just a sense about when you can look back at parenting, you know, you don't, offer random advice to parents you don't know but at the same time you want to say like stop and pause and talk about these things and so this set of tips would be really helpful so I think we've covered a lot I want to make sure that before we leave here today that um, we've answered the vast majority of questions and um, I do think Roger doing one on the health curriculum would be like really fun actually to I talk think that more would be about great that. Kim you can come great. back with us if you want <laughs> yes. um, you know, they're very, very intertwined. And I think we're also working on um, curriculum forward facing documents, which we wanted to update so that people can like look at that. And it's just a, a world where people are getting so much information that they really need us to help them kind of navigate sure. boiling it down. But I also feel like this is a more personal way to do it. So for those of you that uh, have taken a moment to watch this video, we want to first say thank you to Westboro TV. Um, we're coming to an end here. I think one of the things that we really want is for the community and our parents and our students, whoever watches this, to have confidence that love, care, kindness, empathy are the themes of this work and generosity of spirit of, you know, seeing all the good and helping everyone to feel like this is a place, Westboro is a place for them, for schools, for the community is, is what motivates us to do this work um, and certainly brings me to work, work each day. Um, we also will do some other series that will be fun and, and again, we'll see what feedback we get from this. So um, thank you for joining us. And again, uh, we hope you enjoyed learning about social emotional learning.